welcome to this evening. Thanks for joining us. And um, so Fergal, you might just start with telling us about the farm, how you farm and uh, what are your systems and why you've chosen these systems? Um, I have a small, lake, a small farm, 25 acres in Outwards Neo. Um, most of it is traditional hay meadow, um, a bit of fen, uh, wet meadow, and we have a, a couple of early cover crops for corn crates, specifically planted nettles, hogweed, and iris. And then we've got a wild bird crop for twice and little other crops for um, great yellow bumblebee, mostly um, facelia for them as well. So if you were to take me through your kind of annual season by season, the work <coughs> that you do for these, these species, what would it look like in general? Um, well, every year I try and um, create a new cover plot for corn crick. So that usually starts in the, in, the, in the winter. So what I do is I dig out nettle sods from a, a horse estate in uh, Kildare. So usually dig out maybe four, depending on how much compost I can get, I usually dig out around 500 sods. So that'd be around um, half meter by half meter in area. And then you dig them up, kick off the dirt and the soil, and then transport them to a dairy farmer, a friend of mine who used to work for Liam Wiley. And then what we do there is we wash all the soil off, pick all the grass, scotch off it. And once you have all that done, you bring the sods to Mayo. And then in the early spring then, we buy in loads of spent mushroom compost or farm yard dung, spread it out um, with a digger, and then break up our rhizomes over that, covered with a tin layer of spent mushroom compost, and shake in a bit of common hogweed as well. So that's um, creating a, a new cover area. And then we have to maintain the other cover areas then. So we've a uh, one quarter of an acre of an iris bed. So what I have to do over the winter is um, clear out any uh, rank growth on concrete. Like, an open sward so you have to get rid of um all the rank grass out of that so use a strimmer or a knife and just clear out all by hand and <clears throat> then for the the other nettle beds um the established nettle beds we have to um make sure there's no kind of um competitive weeds growing like scotch grass or cleavers especially or creeping thistles so we um try and get them out and then we have to hand fertilize the nettle sandwich um, super phosphate. That's kind of important because um, for dense nettle beds to to maintain a dense nettle bed, you have to have a high phosphorus content. Uh, so we use super, super phosphate and just broadcast that over over your nettle stem. So we get two applications of super super phosphate, then one in March and one in April, then, and then um, the nettles are good to go then for the concrete coming back then. Okay, so just so I understand, in your twenty five acres. How is it split up? Have you got different? Is it the management? Yeah. Is it every field has got different, totally different managements? Or yeah, so I'm in the National Parks Concrete Farm Plan. So um, Barry there with us. Um, when I joined the scheme, he came out to the farm with Michael Martin, who's an agricultural consultant. So they drew up a plan for each specific field that I have. So utilizing um, the land there for the concrete. So like in the wet field, nettles won't grow. So we manage around quarter of an acre for. For, net, for iris down there and with a bit of a hogweed bed down there. And then we've four separate um, nettle plots then planted, generally in the best parts of the farm where it's kind of dry. And then we have a species rich fen as well. Um, that's not really great for concrete, but it's good for other you know, plant life and biodiversity in general. So we, as well as that during the autumn, then we dug out a small pond there. And then on another section, then we plant a crop for a, for a uh, twice. So what we did with there, we uh, contacted the RSPB in Scotland. They have a lot of experience with growing crops for twice. So they recommended fodder radish. So fodder radish is a um, it's high oil context, so it's good for wintering twice. So we, we plant that in a crop then. And then uh, for the for the great yellow bumblebee, um, the species risk sword kind of looks after them. Um, they, what they need is um, red clover early in the season and then um, that use yellow rattle and you know, a plant which is great for them in later seasons if great or not great. But then as well to supplement that we um we grow phacelia so it's great for bumblebees. So that's an easy plant to so it'll um what I usually do is if there's any tractor work on the farm anywhere that's kind of dug up or poached a bit, just broadcast your uh, 
um, deceiving in that and rake it in as a grow away then like you know. Great. And just to go, you've obviously got a huge diversity of habitats and yeah. you're building on that the whole time. Yeah. When you got the farm, was it was it very diverse anyway or no, is that why um, you picked it or well the reason i picked it was it was um i was working in wicklow mixed practice at the time so it was the nearest place to wicklow with a, a sustaining population of concrete so that was the nearest place so four and a half hours drive. Really, so yeah just out <laughs> <good. laughs> great yeah yeah well. <laughs> and then moving on to the con corn creek um, and it, it it so you heard it twice this year, did you? Or no, um, I saw it once, but um, there was around seven males up there, so it's easy to hear the males, but it's very difficult to see them. But I am, um, I saw one of the males down in my iris patch this year, so he kind of flew up from my. Oh, he was calling in under the wall, and then he flew up and had a peek, and he saw us happening. Just to say thanks. Uh, yeah. And when you got the land, um. It, it, you were just saying it's the nearest place of concrete. Did it have much of a population, or has that increased with your management? Um, it would be a traditional area for concrete, but there was no concrete on the on my plot of land because it was a kind of a continuously grazed. So sort of actually, um, one of my advisors, there, John Carey, kind of notified me there recently that in two thousand nine, before I bought the farm, there was a survey done, and it was deemed kind of improved grass grassland. Okay. So would have been very species. Um, diverse then but over the years then um, we, I I fertilise the nettles but I don't fertilise the, the meadows so the fertility in them is going down so you, you get more, a lot more wildflowers than when, when, I, when I started off then like now. And do you cut them for hay or haylage or? One thing about the concrete is um, concrete he needs farming so if you abandon the land there it, it, uh, the grass will become rank so it's not really utilised by concrete then. So what we do is um, we mow um, the iris field and the fen in the middle of September because um, the middle of September is, is the best date is because uh, the latest concrete will hatch on September 1st. But concrete, they need to be two weeks uh, minimum age to safely survive more. So 14th of September is, the, is a good day for that. And then so I, I cut the, the wet fields then. Because if, if I leave it any later, then I might be able to mow the wet fields at all because it kind of gets rainy. And then... For the, the hay meadow then we cut in in october then okay so we, we, we usually cut for for silage but i have i have cut for hay that late as well okay so just on a commercial level do you sell your hay um yeah sell the sell the sell the silage or the or the hay to local farmers then I think. and is it still do farmers report back to you is, is it nutritionally rich enough for their cattle um, in well, September? Honestly, um, it, it, it wouldn't be as good like as your if you'd a rye grass field cut in, in June, like, but um, since the sward is um, kind of uh, very slow growing, it wouldn't be as as um, stemmy as you would if you had a fast growing plant like rye grass. So it's, it's good um, to be a decent maintenance crop for kind of if you had a uh, heavy and calf kind of continental cattle mm -hmm. who don't you don't want to feed them up too too much because uh, the calf get big, but it's good kind of um, uh, vitamin and mineral balance balanced diet. So it's good for heavy and calf content and cows, like you know. You're not gonna you're not gonna fatten cattle with it, like but but it's a yeah. good mate to see, like you know. Okay, good. Um I'll just ask a couple more questions and then I'll pass you on to Barry. Um so I was listening to your podcast again this week. So uh, Fergal has a really nice podcast with Farming for Nature. If you want to listen to that, it's on our website. Um and <laughs> what struck me about that podcast, the thing that really stood out for me is you were saying the neighbours used to call you the yank when you first turned up because of your strange ways, I suppose. Um, and now no, they're... Kind of, um, I, I bought the land from a, oh, a, yeah, a, of a widow, so um, some of the locals weren't too happy about that. But when, when, you, when, when they see you around putting in the hard work, like not being a yank, like they, yeah. um, <laughs> they, yeah. kind of, they kind of accept you that. So they don't really call me the yank anymore. Just they don't call you the yank anymore, that's good. Uh, but just out of interest, are they engaging with you a lot more, uh, Fergal? And are they are they incorporating many of your kind of habits into their own farming practices? Um, well, luckily no. Um, like one of my neighbours there, Kennedy, <coughs> I'd be good friends with him. He's given me a lot of advice, like you know how to manage my meadows and stuff like you know. So he's he's been farming there for forty years. So there's not much he doesn't know about concrete or anything like you know. So what I um I kind of good friends with him now, and he actually allowed me to. We put up a chuff nest box in there. There's a room called Glebe House beside the farm. 
So I, I contacted Barry and um, I said, because there was wintering chuff there, and I asked Barry, what could we do for the chuff? Is there anything we could do? And Barry, he got me a, an hour sleeping nest box for nothing. So it, the National Parks dropped it out. And then Barry said, we'll just try and find out where exactly the chuff used to be. So Kennedy was able to show me the exact same ledge 15 years ago where the chuff used to nest. So we stuck up the nest box and within a year, then they were nesting them. Like, no. That's amazing, isn't it? That was a, a lot cheaper than that never does or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the proof that uh, if you put the boxes there. Well, the, the local knowledge is important, like, you know. The yeah, local, that's really true. And actually, just moving on from that in terms of the knowledge and stuff, if you were... Um, you know when you did set when you, you did start out you, you were saying that you found the national parks and stuff where did it, where did you go for all your advice and all the support that you needed i mean obviously you come with a certain amount of passion about nature yourself but yeah. you know d did you start turning to other places for support and advice and if so where were these places um well the national parks is, is the number one like um Unless you unless you know what you're doing, you're not going to you're not going to be able to create those habitats like those nettle habitats. They're they're they're, they're difficult to make. So Barry and Michael Martin would be the, the number two one no, number two there. And then there was a there was a, a field worker. He was um he did the field work in West Connacht for the Connacht for seventeen years. So I pestered him for like for the last nine years. Um, so he knows a lot about Connacht their habitats. So get a lot of knowledge from him. Um, the RCB in Scotland, um, they have long-standing concrete programs up there. So I am in contact with uh, the wardens on the Isle of Col, there's a big concrete population up there, and the Isle of O. And then um, basically um, picked up a lot of knowledge from local farmers, Kennedy, um, tillage farmers, um, dairy farmers, who I used to work with, like, you know, so like, if you, like any man or woman, like who says they know it all, is not telling the truth, like you have to, and get as much knowledge as, as possible from, from everybody like you know incorporate incorporating everything like you know and from what you learn yourself then as well like you know yeah brilliant excellent i'll hand you over to barry now just to encourage anyone if they have a question for fergal just to pop it in the chat box which is at the banner it's on the bottom of my computer it might be in a different space it's just a, a box saying chat and you can put it there or else you can raise your hand and then um you can go to him directly barry over to you hey fergal come sign crack Oh, all good. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> things are tough. I uh, hadn't expected to to, to be co-hosting, uh, so hopefully uh, uh, some decent questions for you anyway. But the, the one thing that strikes me, Fergal, um, whenever you talk is just your, your graciousness, I suppose, in thanking other people that have helped you along the way. Um, but uh, And that's obvious, like, you know, the, the, the amount of good people that you have had help you is just amazing and it's been so yeah. heartening it shows how much support and how much oh, yeah. um encouragement is out there for the work that you're doing but um above all that like it's very very clear the amount of work that you're personally putting into the amount of money you have put in the amount of time in particular you have put in is just phenomenal and um i'm just you know you're just talking there about the um advice that you've been getting from different people and I just wonder how much, like obviously it'd be difficult to put a proportion on it, but obviously a lot of what you're doing as well is learning by doing. And yeah. could you tell us a little bit about that, about trial and error? And look, I suppose we, we shouldn't be afraid to make errors either and learn by doing, I suppose, you know? No, like you, you, you learn from your mistakes. Remember, remember last year, um, um, my nettles weren't going, going so good early on in the season, kind of made a bit of a few mistakes there. So I rang you up. I was kind of a bit upset about it, but um, you, we set up a meeting then yourself, um, Michael Martin and John Carey and Irene from National Park came out within around two weeks. You went through the nettle beds and you gave me a kind of a management plan. Um, one of the mistakes I was making, I was I I, I was mowing the, the nettles in the autumn when I didn't really need to. So when I mowed the nettles in the autumn, um, especially with the high fertility in the soil, that was leaving an opportunity for kind of chickweed and cleavers to come in. And so I was getting a lot of problems with chickweed and cleavers. So then last autumn, then we didn't mow. And we just removed um, any bits of scotch grass that are had grown there. And the net has grew back, back again, like, you know. So often, often like, you know, um, a lot of the stuff which we're doing is kind of, um, like people have been growing crops of wheat and barley and maize for, for the last 20 years. So there's, there's technology there, there's advice there, but um, 
there's not a lot of lads kind of going kind of uh, little props of concrete like you know so you have to make mistakes like you know that's how that's how you learn, learn from it like you know yeah yeah absolutely and um you mentioned both the the horse estate and Kildare that you're getting the nettles from do do they know the end product and how it's all going have they ever been out to your land or oh no no actually i, I started digging the nettles before i got permission first but, <laughs> but I, I i knew a farmer who um who grazed a few cattle there and he said dig away and then and then you know once i told him what i was doing like they were, they were happy enough like they thought it was a bit odd all right like you know but um, yeah. I've, digging, I've been digging nettles there for, for six years now, so they, they don't mind me at all. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, do they know that they're, they're part of the, the story, I suppose, of conservation of uh, an endangered well, species? Yeah, the, the, the farm manager there, um, anytime she sees me, like, she, she asks me how, how, how are the nettles getting on. I, I'd always have an all picture on the phone and kind of, they'd be happy enough to end with it. Like. <laughs> Excellent. And could you tell us maybe what sport you get from, from those in your family, you know, your partner Aoife, it's been, I suppose, yeah. like a lot of us in conservation, I suppose, it's the unsung heroes, I suppose, the people in the background, yeah. the, the, the partners, etc., that, you know, have to put up with our mood swings and our, you know, no, um, some depression when things are going wrong. And, I know, yeah. And, I, I can be, um, especially, you know, I remember 2019, the netters were going, going bad, like at the start of the season, so I was getting a bit of a panic then. If you, if you talk about netters constantly, then, like, you know, about my, you know, Aoife, she'd be on. Um, she um she'd be very supportive like you know if i was up in mayo for the for like in three or four days she'd mind the dog and the cat like you know, the dog and the cat and Mary's important as the concrete like, you know yeah. so she'd give, you, she'd give you a lot of support there and my father as well um he's in his late 70s but he comes up and he's a he's a great man to work too like you know yeah. and uh but um he put in a good day's solid work like you know so oh absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you've met him there yourself like you know but yeah. um he gets great pride in it too, like you know, um, even though he's retired, he, he, he'd be always asking me, um, Jesus, when you won up again, you know, plant the nettles, like you know, so yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't do it without support, like you know, you can't. Like, you know. He's a great man. I remember being up at your place one really rainy, shitty day, and I don't know what month of the year it was, but um, you yeah. know, the two of you were down in your oil skins and you were planting in individual. Flag iris, right. uh, the yeah. fellas from the, the the yellow iris into into the sandy kind of soil down the the, the lower yeah. fields there, yeah. and it was just like uh, seeing you out of the paddy fields, you know, it was just yeah. fucking yeah. witness and. I yeah. remember Kennedy said it said to me, "Father he says, are you going to the pub after?" He says, Jesus says, and we're going to sleep." He says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like you know, I, I suppose you know you'd see, I suppose for people from looking from the outside in it, it, it's a really romantic notion a really romantic idea of yeah. bringing a species back to a yeah. place that was just barren you know ground really with not much growing on it at all and um so it's it's, it's a really lovely idea it always will be and it'll be something that you can say you know when you when you've left this world that you that you have yeah. created a major difference like you know you've done well with your time on this earth yeah. but like it's romantic, but it's fierce, hard work, isn't it? It's just so yeah. back written. Uh, I've seen the work that you put in. Um, it is not really like you know. I don't go to the gym and I I, I don't drink or I don't go out. <laughs> you know, so I spend my time. You know, people go to the gym and they they work out for a couple of hours. Like I go and I dig nettles for a couple of hours. So it's no more than anyone else. But it's uh, you get the satisfaction of of your nettles growing. Like you know, I know I'll be wrecking your head during the spring too. I'll be sending texts and nettles growing and stuff. <laughs> So, um, and I, I, I just ask another couple of questions. I see there's a lot of questions coming in, um, so we'll give everybody a chance. Um, but just on the, you know, I, I liked the the title of the session tonight. It wasn't just about corn Greg And um, can you tell us, you know, you, you touched on the great yellow bumblebee and snipe and chuff and um, the fin habitat and everything like that. Like it's a holistic approach, really. And um, you know, it's not just managing for the Oh. One. Could, could you tell us maybe how it all stitches together um, and how maybe I suppose you know nature is all one big network really and um, how have you seen any interplay between habitats and species or how the whole thing then, works together? Like, like sometimes in the media they say these concrete schemes are like they're getting a lot of money you know it's a lot of money going for one species but when you're protecting the concrete, you're not just protecting your concrete, you're protecting the whole ecosystem there. Like, you know, you, you've, you know, um, the nettle beds, they're there 
there's a lot of levers used then during the spring. So a lever is going to be the 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 doe will have her levers in the nettle beds protecting her against foxes. Your late your late mode nettle beds, um, when they're as cold as late as they are, they're going to fledge a lot of skylarks and meadow pipits that are breeding there too. Um, the fen habitat, like you know, um, like the the meadow to be orchid rich, like uh, there's um. Heat spotted orchids, common spotted orchids, um, marsh orchids, early purple orchids, like uh, like like a multi-species uh, meadow like that. They're gone very rare as well. Like you know, they're, they're, they're not. They're, there's not a lot of them. Like you know, like especially go where we're living in Dublin. There, like if you go out to any meadows there, like it's ryegrass, or if you're lucky, maybe they had a bit of a clover. Um, so so like even the the meadow itself is an endangered habitat. The fen as well, like you know, um. Um, there's not a lot of intact fens left, like you know, so, so it, it all works together. Like the, the, the habitat management for the conquer is benefiting, is benefiting everything, like you know, like especially the when you're cutting your when when we started first, like it was um kind of ryegrass probably dominated the meadows. Then as we're as we're um not really fertilizing the meadows, um late mowing the, every year, the amount of red clover in our meadows is increasing. So when you think about it, like if you're applying nitrogen to your to your land, like that that inhibits your clover. If you're putting on a lot of nitrogen, that will that will wipe away your clover. As well as the years go by, then our our clover is going up. So that's better food habitat for um for the grey hill bumblebee, like you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So Bridget, maybe you might hand back yep. to you for yeah, a absolutely. Of Thanks for doing Barry. Um, and there's a great, there's a load of questions coming in here, but I might just start there, Fergal. With uh, there was one emailed me to me earlier in the week from uh, David Cotter. Fergal, is it possible to hatch and foster young corncrakes in an area made suitable for their survival, in the hope that following their departure in autumn they will return to that location and breed, form a new population? I saw a rep uh, program reporting this in the Fens area in England, although I think there was a small surviving population remaining there also. So Fergal, can you Yeah, um, I wouldn't recommend it for where I am. Like there was a, was a reintroduction program in the, uh, the, the Nin Washes in Cambridgeshire in England. So RSVB, they spent an awful lot of money reintroducing corncrakes there. As well as that, a, a corncrake is, um, they're a short-lived species, so Unlike uh, like your raptor reintroductions, where you, for white eagles, I think they release a hundred birds. For conquerors, you're you're going to go up into your thousands of birds to release them. So it's an awful lot of money that probably will be better spent um, spending on on an area where there is conquerors present. Like you know, it's more more efficient use of, of your money. As well as that, if you started releasing conquerors into Mayo, you're going to be um diluting I suppose the Irish gene pool there like you know so um that wouldn't be a good idea either like you have a similar problem with um <clears throat> on the continent where they kind of release uh, European quail for shooting and they can um um kind of crossbreed them with wild birds and you know it, it actually do damage to, to, the, to the population like if, if you're going to, to reintroduce um a population concrete anywhere else in the country like you can't really do it where the where there is indigenous Irish birds present, like you know. Mm -hmm. So um we have two meta populations left in Ireland. We have the, the Northwest Donegal population and then we have the West Connacht population. So if you want to do reintroduction program, maybe you do carry or the Shannon Callows like, but there's no point reintroducing any birds unless the habitat is there and the habitat is right, like you know. And especially that there's delayed mowing going to take place like because there's no point wasting all your money releasing a whole lot of corn crooks with insufficient early cover beds like iris and um, nettles and hogweeds, and then have you know, people mow, mowing in May, so they'd be just gone pretty quickly. Like, you know. mm -hmm. And maybe this is a question more for Barry, that, uh, I don't know, but if you were a farmer and you do have a very strong interest in a corn creek and it, you do live in Kerry or, or, or in the Shannon Callows, as you mentioned. Uh, like, is there a, a guide online to building habitats or, or, or would you say contact the, uh, com contact Barry, say, Barry, you do, I don't know if you want to input here. Or... Yeah. So if you wanted to create habitat, we have the farm plan scheme, the National Parks and Wildlife Service farm plan scheme. There's, uh, if you look up 
National Parks and Wildlife Service or NPWS Farm Plan Scheme Corn Creek on Google. Um, that should bring you to uh, our terms and conditions for that particular um, scheme and that would provide advice on how habitat is created. It would give a certain amount, but it's not going to replace really, I suppose, hands-on advice because in our experience, we have a number of farm plans for Corn Creek and each field sometimes is different and it requires that hands-on advisory and we've been blessed really with um, Michael Martin in particular uh, as the farm planner, uh, very very experienced and knowledgeable um, agri-environmental uh, planner and um, he has uh, you know worked with the farmers and that's kind of what I was getting at with Fergal earlier on when I was talking about the trial and error, like we don't have all the answers either necessarily and we learn as we go and um, you know what works in one place might not work in another place, um, so it, it depends from site to site. Um, the farm plan scheme we hope to um, you know take it forward a bit more in future years, it has been curtailed in recent years due to you know, since I suppose the economic crash in 2010 um, and we've been starting to gear it up again uh, more recently, we opened it up to, to new farm plan participants um, and we'd hope to do more of that in, in, in the future. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question, Bridget. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks, Barry. Um, okay, so Fergal, there's a question here from uh, Trish Fox. Facilia isn't a native species, just wondering if there's any plans to replace it uh, with a native flower maybe? Um, I'm not. I'm not too sure. But uh, it was um, Trisha. Actually, she's collected a, a kilogram of uh, co-parsley seeds for me recently, so she has <laughs> defaulted me. So, uh, so thanks very much for Trisha there. <laughs> first of all, um, uh, the way I use utilize the phacelia, um generally sold in in plots of land which are you know, damaged from maybe the tractor or um, uh, being poached a small bit. It, it is non-native, um, but I, I wouldn't think um, it'd be too much of a risk that it's going to spread throughout the rest of the farm. But it, uh, like the RSPB use it in, in Scotland specifically for the for the Great Emerald Wombi. So I, I probably wouldn't think to be using it on, on, if it was kind of a, a dangerous plant to, to be used, but you know. Okay, here's a question from uh, Daniel Devine. Uh, hi Fergal, do you have uh, many crows or wood pigeons around? What is the impact of these on Corn Creek? Um, yeah, there's a, a good bit of uh, hooded crows there. Unfortunately, since I don't live in um, Mayo, um, if I was living there, I would kind of um, uh, maybe set up a larson trap or anything like you know. But um, the more thinking about the Corn Creek is if the habitat is good, there's less problems with, with corvids. Like if you go to an area, maybe in some sites in northwest Donegal, they're heavily grazed and overgrazed. So the corvids are very vulnerable when, when they have no cover. So um, we actually got a few uh, hooded crows removed there last year because they were um, kind of um, interfering with the chuff. So it was more, we got rid of them for, for kind of chuff protection rather, rather than from the corvids. So well, I, I'm confident enough by any of this stage that they, they, they but of course, it wouldn't be too much of a problem with 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 the corn grip. Once the habit is re is really good, like you know, once the cover is good, um, there is less of a problem. Like uh, you have species like um, um, lapwing. Their their kind of nest sites are more exposed, so they're they're very vulnerable to corvid predation. But um, the hen corn grip, she'll have her her nest there tight in the in the nettles or, or in in the meadow. So you're they're they're not going to be the cor 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 is like hooded crows, especially they they're very clever. They'll if they had it, if you see a, a lapwing with a nest, she'll see the lapwing coming in and she'll take the eggs or the chick, but she's not going to be able to see the concrete coming in, so it's, it's less of a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a question from Margaret Brennan. Um, do you know of a good way to control the creeping thistle? Bees seem to like them, but they can take over. Um, unfortunately, like the farm isn't organic, so you, with creeping thistle, um, it's a danger in a nettle bed, so you kind of have to spot spray it. It's like not not a broad not a broad spectrum spray all over the place, but a, a spot spray. Or alternatively, if there's not too much, you can just um, take it out. Like, but if you the, the creeping thistle likes the fertility which the, the nettle beds have, kind of high in P, high in K. So if you didn't control the creeping thistle, it'll overtake your your whole nettle bed. And one thing about the, the concrete, um creeping distal in a nettle bed is not good for concrete so you kind of have to be 
kind of pragmatic about the situation too, like and um, have to control creeping thistle. For the rest of the farm, there's because the I don't want to fertilize the meadows. The fertility is kind of low in the rest of the meadows, so it's actually hardly any creeping thistle then. So um, the only creeping thistle really be in and around the nettle beds, like you know. Mm -hmm. Um. Sorry, this is a a question from a Finton Damore. Hi, Fergal. I was on the mullet on the mullet in the it just gone, and I checked out your hard work. I noticed that your fodder radish, although in full flower, did have much pollinators on it. That might be didn't have much pollinators on it. Um, have you ever considered something else that might provide a dual benefit of providing for pollinator as well as winter food for twite? Um, yeah, fodder radish wouldn't be great for pollinators but you have to kind of be pragmatic about it as well like the, there's only probably around 50 to 100 pairs of twipe left in the country and um, there's a small residual population on one of the peninsula there so twipe have been nearly in a worse situation in the country so they're, they're on the verge of extinction so um it's not a huge area there's only one third of an acre um sold for, for the father right? so when you have your kind of cost benefit analysis done is probably provide more of a benefit than not than not by providing a benefit. As well as that, we um we actually um there's a midland ringing group um they they helped me out too. They um they give me around three or four hundred kgs of Niger seed every um winter. So they ring the birds as well. So was it in twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen they ringed a whole heap of birds and the fat condition of the birds was fairly they were mud fat like so and that was in January or February. So, you know, and obviously it's providing good food for them, like, you know, and increase, increase the body condition score of the, of the twice, and that would go forward then to the breeding season if, if a hen twice, which is in good condition, she can maybe lay more eggs and rear more chicks. And it'd be the same as a, a cow, like, you know, if you have a whole sand cow and she's a poor body condition score of one or two, she's not going to come into season, um, she's not going to go on calf. And then when she does go on calf, um, when she can have sound, she's not going to make poppy. So um, it's not just about well, keeping the toy fed for the winter, it's about keeping them good body condition go for the breeding season ahead, like, you know. Okay. But I, I see I see I see where Finton is is coming from, like, you know. Yeah. But, um, it's trying it's trying to it's hard to get um it's hard to get everything it's right. Balance. But, but, then, but balance, yeah, but uh, with the rest of the meadows is species rich then. So that is good for pollinators, like you know. Yeah, perfect. Um, I'll just give you a mini break because this is a question for Barry, really. This is from David Cotter. Barry, if you want to do something to help wildlife in your local area but may not have unique biodiversity or be aware of it anywhere, anyway, is there anyone you can contact to find out how best you can help? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's actually something that we were discussing recently, Bridget, for the Farming for Nature platform um, for farmers or landowners that want to do something for their uh, biodiversity nature on, on their land and the first step would be I suppose you know letting nature tell her story and just sitting and, and observing um, because sometimes you might have an idea like oh I'd like to put in a hedge it's good for birds or good for bats or whatever but you know if you're to put that into an area where there's a rare reading wader like lapwing or or curlew or whatever like you know it might be the worst thing you could do um so it's really important to firstly determine what is on your land and how to go about doing that you know if you don't have skill sets yourself or if, uh, if you don't have the knowledge um they're usually in ireland we we're a small enough old country and you know the network in the community is small enough in the conservation and in nature side of things and i think um if anybody is on social media that's one of the positive sides of social media, I suppose, you know, that you're able to reach out and discover somebody, um, you know, that won't be too far away from you that might be able to help out. So if you were to get in touch with, um, you know, anybody that you might see that's interested in nature um, in Ireland on, on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it might be, um, or to get onto any of the uh, bigger ENGOs like Birdwatch Ireland or the Irish Wildlife Trust. The National Parks and Wildlife Service also, we would have local rangers in each area and um, we would have a contact page on the National Parks and Wildlife Service. I think it would be npws.ie forward slash contact us. 
but um, you'll find it somewhere in the NPWS website anyway. So I, I, I would say reach out and then also maybe in some of the universities as well and ITs, you know, there's uh, different um, environmental courses and wildlife biology courses, etc. And maybe to make contact with them. But I'd say just ask um, anybody that you can. Um, and um, where um, I think is a David, wherever he is, I, I, I could... Um, maybe just send him a message privately on the Zoom meeting and um, maybe give him some contacts locally there. And I think it's in County Meet, I could be wrong. Um, so yeah, yeah. there's, there's never, help is usually not too far away. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thanks for that. And um, just staying with you there, Barry, and also then Fergal can come in after, but this is a question from Paul Archer. Fergal, Barry, what would it take to bring this approach to land management for conservation into the mainstream farming scenario? Rep seems to offer much, but has had mixed results. So how can it be scaled up to be something other than a labour of love for concerned in individuals like yourself? I might just start with you, Barry, and then you can hand over to Fergal. Yeah, firstly, it, it can be done, um, but I just can't emphasise enough how much work and effort Fergal has put in in particular. And um, I think passion goes an awful long way um, and to replicate what Fergal has done really a lot of that the majority of that is down to Fergal and, and, and nobody else um, whatever scheme you're in or whatever like if Fergal happened to be in Gloss I'm sure he would have made a super success of it or in reps or anything like that he would have still have made a super success of it um, the way that we're going about things um, with the Department of Agriculture um, they are now developing the cap strategic plan and there will be uh, more of a focus on results and um, I suppose a results-based approach as well for certain agri-environment schemes. And towards that, the Department of Agriculture actually partners with the National Parks and Wildlife Service and a number of others, including Nuda Ross and Photo Wildlife um, and GMIT on a new exciting project, the Corn Creek Life Project that we put a bid together, um, put in an application to the European Commission into the LIFE unit there. And we were successful earlier on this year in getting funding for uh, Corn Creek LIFE. And that will be a main vehicle to take forward in the next number of years, over the next five years, for delivering a habitat for Corn Creek. Um, so we're going to be active in the special protection areas and developing um, you know a lot along the lines of what we've been doing in the farm plan scheme with Fergal uh, etc um, in terms of delivering new habitats and um, also bringing in a results-based uh, approach to a scorecard scorecard for the condition of the early cover for the birds and also for the meadows um, so then that would incentivize participants in schemes to deliver the best quality habitat possible because the payment would be reliant on the score that they get for the habitat. So I think that would motivate um, a lot of people to, to drive on and, and, and deliver the best habitat possible. Um, and obviously at the start of it, um, you know, just in case it scares anybody, the results-based approach, the, the, the costs of um, setting aside land or whatever, that, that should be covered in any case, like, you know, um, and the results um, then paid thereafter um, according to the results, uh, that, that the score that the, the, the particular plot gets. Um, but yeah, it is being looked at absolutely by ourselves and by the Department of Agriculture because it does need to be upscaled if we are to save the species and put it on a sustainable footing going forward. Okay, great. Fergal, um, I'd say that probably answers that question, but Fergal, just a question for you. Um, uh, William Fitzsimmons, I'm new to farming for nature, very keen to begin. I have four acres of green field, currently cut silage ground, is very uh, compact and would love to encourage biodiversity and possibly the corn creek. Where do I start, I suppose, is the question. Um, probably, unless you're within a kind of a corn creek area, it'd be very difficult to attract corn creeks into the area. Hell's Con need, sorry. Yeah, probably, probably not. But, um, you can do a lot of things though, like um, uh, you can easy, you can create a species rich uh, sward um, fairly easily uh, over a couple of years, maybe four to five years. If they cut late every year, bail away the grass, decrease the fertility in the sward, um, you'll have more space for wildflowers then. Another thing that would be good would be to sow some yellow rattle. Yellow rattle is, um, I have a lot of it on my, in my meadows, it's a hemi-parasitic plant. So it parasitizes fast-growing grasses like ryegrass, and then that gives enough room in for wildflowers to grow. So if you sow it, 
that in, in the meadow. You, you only have to really kind of rake it in and broadcast and rake. And over subsequent years, then your meadow will probably change from being kind of, uh, kind of improved wild grass sward to a more multi-species sward. And then as the fertility decreases over, over years, then often you, you have still have the seeds in the seed bank, they're in the soil, like, you know, so you just need a, an opportunity with the reduced fertility and uh, the yellow rattle, the wildflowers will come back. As well as that, like EVM, as well as what Barry said as well, um, kind of look around the farm, see what, what you have, like, you know, if you have um, hedgerows, let them grow, um, cut them on a three to four year basis. Um, maybe if you have a bit of a drain there, see can you dig out another pond there? Like a pond would be kind of nearly one of the best things you can do um, for your farm. Like like I, I dug out a, a pond um, eight meters by four, um, and it cost me hundred euros. Like you know, so it, it's, it's cost effective. Like you know, so a pond, it, it, no matter what, any what anyone land to have, if you're in the garden in a in a town or anything, um, a pond is nearly the best and, and the easiest thing you can do. Like you know. So what, what one thing about the ponds is um um check the water table when it's out of strides. So if you're during the summer and there's a bit of a wet patch in the field, that might be a good place to to dig out a pond, like you know, or if if a, if you have a drain there in the field, dig out from that. Um, you can dig a pond out from that. Like so, there's there's, there's a lot of things you, you can do um cheaply and easily. And uh, as Barry said, um um try and get advice, like you know. Um, there's a, a, a lady called Donna on Twitter, and she's um she's a legend for um creating um uh, multi-species swords. So if you contacted her or anything, and there's loads of people on Twitter, as Barry said on Facebook, um Irish Wildlife Trust, um they have loads of ideas on on how to um manage even small plots of land, like you know. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and just on just on that as well, actually, um just for William. Like, uh, you know, the corn crake is obviously an iconic species, um, but, you know, there, there are species in need uh, right across Ireland. And if you have land or if you, you, you have somebody that you could ad advise or engage with, like, like Neath is a really important county for the likes of Yellowhammer, which is, yeah. uh, you know, a loss from a lot of the West. So you won't get Yellowhammer in, in Mayo, you won't get it out in the Mullet where Fergal is, um, you won't get it in Kerry or Cork or any place like that. Well, you get it in East Cork, I suppose. But, you know, there's st stuff. In your own local area as well that really does need help you know and that you can um support as well so uh yeah it's well worth um getting you know in touch with, with local groups or whatever and, and finding out what can be done yeah yeah and like you said or and um, fergal said before is that i suppose build habitats you're not just building for one species you're building for loads so there's you yeah. can attract lots there uh, and also farming for nature have a lot of resources as well and guides on how to um, manage land for grassland or tillage or how to build ponds and stuff like that. So do look up our website as well. Um, okay, so the next uh, question is from a David Fallon here, uh, Fergal. What habitat is the Concrete's original home? You stated that they need farming, but where do they exist in this country part of farming, for instance, if you know this? Yeah, um, I suppose... Uh... In Ireland, they would have been on um, floodplains um, like the Callows, so seasonally flooded um, grasslands. Um, as the water is received back, you'll have kind of uh, beds of iris and meadow sweet. And then on the west coast of Ireland, um, where you have Spartanite type grasses, grasses that don't lodge, um, you would have a concrete populations there. So when people, before people came to Ireland, there probably wouldn't have been a lot of concretes in this country. Would have been on the floodplains, like the Callows would be in the near floodplains. Um, the islands off the west there, where you have Spartan type grasses, where you have concretes there. The other habitats in Europe where the concretes would be, you'd be on um, alpine meadows above the tree line. So, well, we don't have that there. And as then, as, as agriculture came into Ireland, then and the forests were cleared, and then you kind of, uh, kind of extensive kind of um, tillage and um, grassland management, concretes exploded in population. And then obviously then when agriculture became more intensive, they were kind of um, exterminated from most of the places like, you know. And you were saying earlier, one of, is one of the biggest factors for the concrete is that farmers cut, instead of hay and leaving it later, they, they're cutting silage. So they're cutting yeah. earlier in the year. Yeah, so like even back in the 60s and 70s, there were still thousands of concretes in the country. And most lads used to cut hay, like, and you have, obviously, 
the cotton hay, you need, you need the good weather. So that's later in the year, maybe late July or usually August. And then during the 80s, then um, silage start to be cut. When you cut silage, you can um, you can cut it a lot earlier. So within two or three years, if you have cut early cut silage in May or June, within two or three years, all your corn should be exterminated in, in the region. So over a couple of years, then corn crooks were exterminated for most of the country. And only only for um, in the early 90s, then there was a delayed mowing scheme set up by the National Parks that basically saved the corn crook. That uh, if a, a, a corn crook was found on the farmer's land, he was given a grant to delay mowing. So without that scheme, the corn crooks would be gone. Like, you know. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, here's a question from uh, David Smith. Um, what is the ratio of early cover to nettle cover in size? Does early cover size greatly affect population size for summer or does majority arrive when nettles have grown? Yeah, I know David Smith, well, David has come out digging nettles with me, so he's a good man to work planning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in the National Park scheme, um, ideally, if you could have 10% of your land area in early cover pots, like, um, so I have 25 acres if you have two acres there. Um, but, but I found myself that uh, if the, the cover area is of extreme high quality, um, you need to you can have less um, cover areas then like you know but obviously the one of the main limiting factors for cockroach is um, early cover so when the cockroaches come back from Africa they need vegetation which is 20, 20 centimeters high so your meadows are only going to be maybe a couple of centimeters high at, at, especially with me because I'm on the coast so um, they go into early cover plus like the nettles and the iris so the more iris uh, hogweed and especially nettles that you have, you have to increase um, higher density of concrete. Like if you have a traditional hay meadow, with, um, you'll have one concrete um, per uh, 10 acres usually. It's a stock in density, but if you have really good nettle beds, you'll have one one per, per hectare. Like, you know, so that's nearly um, two or three times the stock in density for concrete. So, you know. Okay. This is uh, from Brian McDonnell. Um, have you had much interest from neighbouring farmers or do they think you're book mad? Um, well, Kennedy thought I was crazy when I started, but um, um, they, they don't anymore. Like um, the neighbouring farmers, then when there's corncrakes there, they get the delaying mowing grant. So Kennedy will get um, because there's a high number of corncrakes there, he do get um, three thousand euros to delay his mowing. So it's a uh, there's actually a couple of farmers then they're in the national parks um scheme there. There's a lad called Mangan. Um, he's near me. He's in the scheme. Uh, another like called Paddy Keen and gentleman there. He's he's in the scheme as well. So the thing about it is like some people might say you're mad, but um, with all things like if it was uh, if there was more like Barry was saying about the funding for the national park scheme was limited there because of the crisis financial crisis. If you have a good scheme which pays farmers, um, in a results based fashion, and um, they're able to make money from it. And get good technical advice as you get as I get from Barry and Michael and Martin. Farmers will go into it, like you know. So like there's three things you need. You need you need to be financially rewarded for the work you put in, which is only fair, like you know. Um and plus you need um the advice and, and you need the enthusiasm as well, like you know. And there's there's lots of farmers out, out there. Like um like with the action based schemes like last they, they don't really award farmers that the farmers who put in a huge amount of work get the same as a lad who does middle and amount of work, which isn't really fair. And then that kind of, um, that uh, it's a bit disheartening for a lad who puts in a, a load of work and getting the same as that is who's does, who does not, as, you know, when, when the standards are kind of low enough in the last, like, you know. So it's all about kind of um, reward. Like, like people can't be expecting farmers like um, um, just um, devote all their land for wildlife, you know, unless they can put food on the table too, like, you know. Mm. I mean, like, you have yeah. to live. You know. Yeah, exactly. That's where the results-based payment yeah. schemes are, yeah. have a future. Um, okay, Fergal, have you been to any place? Out, this is from a Shane Brown. Sorry, have you been to any place outside Ireland that has good populations of corn crake and picked up methods that may be worth introducing into Ireland? Um, I suppose only uh, I was in Bieszka, Marches, and Bielowieża in um, eastern Poland. They have, they have high populations there, and those there. Um, they have good meadow sweet meadows over there, so that would be might be a, a good. Uh, we might kind of try that with liaison with Barry first. We might try a 
create a bit of a meadow sweet plot and see how, how we get on with that. Like, you know, I don't think any, any farmers in the National Park scheme had a meadow sweet plot, but it'd be, it'd be a good thing to find out, like, you know, it'd be add to, add to There's as well as that, it's good to have a, a number of different plots, like, so just in case your nettles went bad in a year, that you've something to fall back on, like, that you've received an iris plot there, you've a hog weed plot there. Like if you had a meadow sweep plot there as well, so you would more redundancy there than having all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just because Barry opened up this can, I'm going to ask this question to him. This is from Gillian Brian Barry. Hi, we have yellow hammers in a, a small flock during the winter on our land, 17.5 acres, which we're turning into a nature reserve. Have you a specific advice on a cover crop for feeding, winter feeding and supplement feeding that we could put out for them? Thank you. Yeah, I just actually sent Gillian Ryan a link, actually. There's a very good um, resource on the RSPB, Royal Society of uh, Protection of Birds, um, their website. Um, so oftentimes I find myself actually looking at it and, you know, putting in RSPB management, yellow hammer. And that's exactly what I did, actually, just two minutes ago, because I wouldn't have a great amount of experience at all with managing yellow hammer, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, if you put that in for birds in particular, the RSPB have some really good and very clear advice for land managers and, and farmers. Um, so they give some of the key points there for yellow hammer, for example, would be to maintain sharp, thick hedges and ditches with wide margins for nesting. Flower rich margins are better for insects than grass margins. Do not trim hedgerows before September as the late nests of yellow hammers are the most important for overall productivity and ensure there is at least one good seed food source throughout the winter. And then they're just the headline bullet points and it goes on then to um, give in more detail on how you could meet those uh, criteria, how you could, how you could support the, the bird. So, but just for any species, if anybody's thinking about managing for any particular bird, that's always a good website to go to is RSPB. Put into Google RSPB management and corn break rspb management lapwing whatever um so it's a, it's a good resource yeah like the right, do, do you, yeah do you have one final question there for fergal and then i'll take over um yeah uh i, I was just gonna i suppose you, you asked a key question really bridget as to you know neighbors or somebody else asked it earlier on um as to you know it's obvious that fergal has a great passion for it and uh, and and that's you know the fruits are are showing there and all with seven corn cracks on on the land this year um but as to how that rubs off on on the neighbors is always a key um interest of mine and you know being a judge on the farming for nature initiative as well it's always a question i would ask the farmers that we would visit as to you know the neighbors um are they taking any leaf out of your book or they they see this as a way forward um so i suppose that that's that's been addressed has it or um is do you want to elaborate on that anymore Fargal or yeah. um I suppose uh Kennedy was was thinking about maybe joining the National Park scheme there for a while. Um but I suppose the fact that I spent an awful lot of work creating nettle beds might have put him off a tiny bit like you know but I be <laughs> um like the minimum center for the National Park scheme is like 30% nettle so I have nearly a hundred percent, but uh, you probably other farmers they probably don't have to go to the extremes, which which I do to do it, like you know. So yeah. um, we're we're actually less yeah. than that, Fergal. It, it it would actually be um just five five percent of the the area actually. So just in case well, there are any farmers, oh, sorry, not, I, I was saying in, in the nettle bed itself, like not not the twelve oh, percent. Oh yes, farm. we're in the nettle bed. Yeah, to have thirty percent. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, um, you know, I, I suppose it'd be remiss of me as well, not to mention, um, you know, Paddy Mangan there up in Cairn. Um, like and Paddy, Mangan, Paddy Mangan is the yeah. man who saves the concrete on the mud. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's a really cr from. crucial point, isn't it? Because you touched yeah. on it earlier, like, you know, that um, where they have been lost from, like, you know, they might never come back again. Yeah. We have essentially in Ireland, we have our eggs in two baskets now, that being your part in, in, in West Connacht and then also up in Donegal. Uh, we've lost them from the Shannon Callows, we've lost them from the Moy Catchment, we've lost them from West Kerry, we've lost them from all, all over Ireland, the bird that would have been all over the country before. And we yeah. could very well have lost them from the mullet if not for Patrick. And yeah. do, you, do you want to say anything about, about Paddy and, and the work that he did back in the, the day himself and his father, I suppose? That's yeah. a really an important link as opposed to where we are today with what you can do. Like Harcrick were down to one bird and Mangan um put in nettle beds there and only for him there'd be no corn crease in the Mother Peninsula, like you know. And as well as that, there was huge work from um, Tim Gordon. He was the field worker there for 17 years. 
and like Tim hasn't worked in the field working there for nine years but all the farmers ask me how is Tim Gore because you know I'm in contact with him like no there's often lads were going to more meadows Tim Gordon would go out and he persuade lads who hated the concrete not to mow and he turned them in favour of the concrete. So it was, you can say it was two people who saved the concrete. It was Mangan and, and Tim Gordon, like, you know, two, two super enthusiastic people, like, you know, and, you know, between the both of them, like, there, there's, there's concrete set in them on the peninsula, like, you know. And, and it's not just, um, it's not just the benefit of the concrete, like, um, there's lots of tourists there come to, to Melmonis Mel to, to hear the concrete. So they're staying here, they're renting houses, they're staying in the local and um, going to the local restaurants, you know. So it's the whole the whole community benefits from it, like you know. So or, like Mangan, geez, I, I haven't met Mangan senior, cause, <laughs> but I think he's dead, isn't he? Or is he? I'm not too sure. But yeah. um, it, geez, there's a a, a a debt of gratitude um from me anyway, and um and his son then he's super enthusiastic as well, like you know, you know um growing nettles as well, like you know. That's really nice to hear. Um, Fergal, this is a question here from Sean Farrell, probably leads on from that. If you're a betting man, Fergal, what are the odds of, for the population of Cold Creek expanding? Um, well, as Barry said there, there's a new EU life project for the Cold Creek. I think it was around 6 million euros there. If we can get um, enough of farmers into kind of a, a schemes like the National Power Scheme and the EU life project, uh, setting aside land, paying farmers proper, um, which is the most important thing, getting good technical advice like from Michael Martin and Barry, um, inc increasing the land in management. There, there is a chance they, they can improve, like, you know. So, but it, it, it's, it's a, it, as, as everything kind of conservation needs, it's down to funding and proper kind of management, proper advice, like, so hopefully they, they can expand, like, with that money behind them, like, you know. But there's lovely examples like yours that people can work off. So that's, that's really nice, you know, success stories to see that they're there and stuff. Yeah. Um, so just moving towards the end of it there, Fergal, how hopeful are you for the future of Irish farming in general and your farm in particular? Um, well, a lot of farmers near, near me, uh, they're finding it tough, like, you know, the supports are there for maybe kind of intensive dairy, maybe intensive beef production there in the east. The lads in the west, small farmers with small homes there, that they've been kind of left behind. I think um, lads aren't making much money from beef. I think if we had a proper um, paid scheme, agri-environmental scheme, that rewarded farmers on a results basis, it could keep a lot of lads in, in business. Like you know, like uh, there's like there's three or four different farmers in the national park scheme who are only part time like me. And that, that the funding they get from the national parks that that keeps them on the land, like you know. But um, we, we kind of need to 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 support those farmers, like you know. We can't just we, as I said before, we can't just expect farmers to do all this kind of work for biodiversity for nothing, like you know, because they need to live too, like you know. So it, it depends. Hopefully, maybe with a green party in government, maybe we can get more and more of kind of a instead of an action based scheme like last, we can get more results based schemes and. You know, help keep lads on the land with that, like you know, maybe less farming, less for for beef or or lamb, and maybe good payments for um biodiversity and environmental protection, water protection, like you know. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so if you were to give farmers one last final tip, every farmer in Ireland, what what at what one thing could they do on their farm? Pant the other pond. Dig out a pond. Dig out a pond and do it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, and there's loads of advice online on how to do that, like you yeah. said before. Yeah. So listen, thank you so much, Virgo, for tonight. Yeah. Your story is really inspiring and what you've managed to achieve is is incredible. And, you yeah. know, on behalf of the Corncrake and the, the Twite and the Great Yellow Bumblebee and the Chuff and all the rest, you know, thank you. Yeah. But thank you so right. much for joining us tonight and thank you to my co-host, Barry. If people yeah. wanted to contact you, um, either of you but Fergal you're on Twitter um, yeah, yeah. and yeah. that people can follow you on Twitter uh, if, if people are into social media uh, Barry if people needed to con wanted to contact you said there's a, the mpws.ie website has a list of contacts and people can find their different kind of ranges and stuff like that but thank you very much for both your contributions tonight um, there's a podcast I mentioned earlier 
uh, with Fergal on our website on farmingfornature.ie. And then if anyone you know would like to see tonight's session but was unable to attend, uh, this will be up on YouTube probably by tomorrow afternoon. So 